Hello, investors. This is Edwin Epperson with Blue Bay Capital, and I am helping capital investors like yourself make wiser, more informed decisions. In this video, I'm going to be covering gap funding, uh, what it is, and honestly, why you as a private lender, unless you have a lot of experience, should not be considering gap funding. Uh, as Sacha G Giltry, I honestly can't pronounce her last name, uh, has once said, our wisdom comes from our experience and our experience comes from our foolishness. So with great reward comes great risk. Gap funding is fraught with risk. So we will be covering what is gap funding. I will also discuss security as well as the risks of gap funding. And last but absolutely not least, we will discuss Blue Bay Capital's turnkey solution for passive investors seeking passive income. What is gap funding? Well, we have a scenario. The borrower has a property that they will be buying and they need a loan. So they find lender A who has the funds to loan, but they have some strict uh, regulations or restrictions. The purchase price is 300,000. The lender's maximum purchase loan to value or PLTV is only 80%. This means the borrower must bring 20% of the purchase price or 60,000 to the table. The future value once fixed up will be 375,000. The amount of renovation is only 35,000 and is basically cosmetic. So the expected time frame for the borrower is only two to three months. What's the problem? The borrower does not have the 20% down nor the repair cost. What are they gonna do? The borrower has found their first position lender and is willing to borrow their funds in exchange for a mortgage being placed in first position on their asset. The borrower decides to reach out to their network of private lenders, in this case, you, and they promise a loan for you to fund in the amount of 95,000. They promise 10% return in three months or less. I mean, it's only cosmetic. How long could it take, right? This is someone you trust because you met them at a few times at a real estate club. Why would they not be trustworthy? You decide to do the loan and the borrower signs a promissory note and hands you this piece of paper. Now, at this point, I would like to point out there are two paths you could be on. One is that you had a mortgage recorded behind lender A's mortgage in second position, securing your $95,000 to the asset. The other path and honestly, most often what I see in these type of scenarios with gap funding, it's not secured. It's considered an unsecured loan. Why? In most cases, lender A will not allow a second position loan after their own position. But more on that later in this video and in others. Let's look at the security of providing a first position loan versus a gap loan. First position means that it is in first debt position that is recorded on the chain of title upon new transfer of ownership of the asset. Regardless if your gap loan is recorded or not, you will never be able to be in first position. You will always be in a junior position, second or lower on the chain of title, or you may not even be in a recorded position. The term secured investments when describing private lending is specific to the fact that the lender records their loan in the local county recorder's office and their lien is of public record. Gap funding, especially if handled by the borrower, is most likely not recorded. We all understand that buyers receive an owner's title policy. This ensures a clean chain of title from the seller and new buyer, and should anything pop up on title, the owner is protected. As a lender, we can require the same protection, and the buyer, our borrower, pays for this. This is only possible if you're creating your loan though. Title companies, uh, they are handling all of this for you. An inter-creditors agreement is basically a notification in a pre-planned agreement that the first position lender will work with any junior lien holder who has this inter-creditor agreement signed in the case of a foreclosure. This is extremely important for any and all junior recorded lien holders to have the first position lien holder sign an intercreditors agreement. Now let's talk about risk. There are many risks, too many to get in here, but I will cover the most prevalent two, values dropping and a foreclosure. 
So we have our first position lender who has their $240,000 note, 80% of the purchase price, which is secured to the asset via a mortgage. The mortgage is a recorded document in the county clerk of court where the property is located. You have decided to loan this borrower the $95,000, which is $60,000 for the down payment and the $35,000 for the repairs. The question is, do you have a recorded position on title or a non-recorded promissory note, i.e. an unsecured lien? Let's look at the first scenario, value drops. We have our property and lender A has their $240,000 secured in first position, while you have $95,000 loaned to the borrower. Let's go ahead and assume that you do have it recorded in second position. When these loans are made, the expected ARV was supposed to be 375,000. That meant our combined loan to value, meaning combined all loans on the property, was a total of 89%. Now, while experienced lenders may balk at that and say, I would never fund that type of loan, too many times inexperienced lenders buy into the borrower's plans, their vision, potential profit, and potentially the short time frame uh, of how long they will hold lender B's money. However, in 12 months time, the value drops by 20%. Now, some of you may be looking at this and saying, wait a second, Edwin, this was only supposed to be a two to three month project. Exactly. But when a market begins to correct, too many times fix and flippers and builders do not want to recognize it, especially in the case where the margins are so tight, such as this one. So they hold on to the property for six months, only to then realize the value is not there. And instead of taking extreme swift measures to offload the property quickly, they reduce the asking price a little bit each month to try and maximize profits. What this turns into is chasing the value to the bottom. So by the time the investor was ready to sell, a year has gone by. This is not uncommon. It happens way more often than you would think in a down market. What we're going to look at next is the capital stack which is debt and equity being used to purchase assets. When a loan is created, made, or originated, it's all about the reward for the borrower and the protection of the first position lender. Lender A has their first position loan of 240,000 in the safest position of the capital stack, debt recorded in first position. You have your loan secured in second position, which is good, but it is behind the first position lender and it's for 95,000. Combined, this represents an 89% CLT ARV, or combined loan to after repair value. Then there is the 11% of potential gross profit, which is what the borrower looked at in this case, as well as the borrower had no skin in the game. This is not good for any lender in any position. And to be honest, there are not that many first position lenders that, this would, that would even allow this. So more than likely your second position would not even be recorded because the first position lender would not do the loan with this much of a CLT ARV. Let's look at what happens when the borrower goes to sell the property. When an asset is sold, the first position lender is always paid first. This is why the capital stack becomes inverted. Also, remember that the property is not being sold for 375,000, but only for 300,000 due to the market shift and what happened and the borrower dragging their feet to get it sold earlier. Before the debt and finally equity is paid out of closing, there are closing costs that must be paid out of proceeds. Upon selling the asset, all agents, if any, are paid 3% each, up to 3% each. Then the seller pays for the title fees for the selling of the property, as well in a down market or a buyer's market. To sell a property, it is customary for sellers to offer seller concessions meaning the seller agrees to contribute X amount of dollars to the buyer for paying the price that they did. Total fees to sell a property can range from 8% to 11%. Even though in this scenario we are in a down market, let's assume the borrower is only being charged 8% to sell the property. 8% of 300,000 is 24,000, and that is paid to any agents and the title company. This leaves us with 276,000 remaining. We now have 276 in selling monies to disperse. Lender A is paid back their first position note. This now leaves 36,000 in remaining sell proceeds to disperse. 
I'm sure you can already see the challenge. Now we have your loan. How does this flush out? With only $36,000 left to pay out, you're at a $59,000 loss. Moreover, if the borrower simply wants the property gone, they would have to bring an additional $59,000 out of their pocket just to be able to sell the property. You may be thinking that's ridiculous. No one would do that. And you are right. Which leads us to the second scenario, risk, which would be foreclosure. I will not cover all the strategies of foreclosures in this video. There are several that are... Uh, that as a second position lien holder, meaning your loan is recorded that you can take, but that is not the purpose of this video. What I am going to address is what happens when a borrower of your second position or maybe more junior lien position stops paying and what the most prevalent risks to you are. As you can see, we have lender A who has been who has made their first position loan secured to the property. The borrower is paying them every month because many second position loans are balloon payments, meaning everything is paid back once the property is sold or refinanced. We will say that you are not receiving any monthly payments, but expect to be paid back your principal plus agreed to interest when the property sells or is refinanced. So now the borrower stops paying. What happens, and more importantly, what happens to your investment? Lender A contacts his attorney, which should specialize as a creditor's attorney, and begins the foreclosure process. When the lender can start, this is all explained in detail in the recorded mortgage. Now the lender and borrower litigate in court, if it is in a judicial state, or the lender goes uh, can go to the sheriff's cell within a few days after filing the paperwork, benefits of a non-judicial state. The sheriff's cell is the main way that a lender recoups their investments and it is commonly expressed as an auction. Foreclosures can be quick, such as in Texas where it can happen in 21 days, or in other states where, ju where judicial foreclosures are allowed, it can take up to two years. During that time, no payments are being made from the borrower to the lender, and penalties and fees are racking up. Also, there's the cost of litigation, which could be as little as a few thousand to tens of thousands. After the filings and or the litigation, the lender A now owns the property, meaning they have title to the property. They retain an auctioneer and set an auction date and the auction price. What does lender A get to include by law in the initial auction price? They, of course, are able to include the principal, but also any accrued and unpaid interest, fees, and penalties, as well as their attorney cost. This is the initial bid. Let's say for the sake of argument and simplicity, the total cost from the day the borrower stopped paying interest until lender A took ownership of the property was $258,000. The day of the auction arrives and we have bidders. Someone bids to buy the note uh, property at 258, then another at 250 or 265, and yet one more bids at 295. No one else bids, so the final offer to the lender is 295,000, which of course lender A accepts. Now the auction is closed and funds are ready for disbursement. Also, you will notice there is no profit. In the case that the bidder did pay $335,000 or more, then the borrower would actually get the proceeds, yet this is rarely ever the case. First off, the auctioneer is paid, but not out of the bid price. This cost of doing business is paid for by the winning bidder, so we still have $295,000 to disperse. Now the disbursement of funds now happens. First, the first position lien owner, this is why positioning on title is so important. The first position lien owner is given back all monies due them to make them whole. Now we get to your loan. There is only 37,000 left to disperse, which would go to you as a second position lien holder. Remember, this is all based on the fact that you had a recorded mortgage at the county where the property was located and you are in second position, not a more junior lien position on title. As you can see, this is not enough, and you are left with a loss of 58,000, and you can do nothing at this point. It's finalized. Now, if you had a personal guarantee with your GAP loan, then you could pursue the borrower in civil court, but this would equate to thousands in more litigation and fees, and then there is always the case where the borrower could simply declare bankruptcy, and now you're out of even more money and there's literally nothing more that you can do. Now this scenario is only if you had a recorded second position lien, 
What happens if you did not have a recorded mortgage? Again, this happens all the time in gap funding. Let's revisit the auction. At this point, you've been riding along lender A's foreclosure process and hoping that at the, at the foreclosure auction, there is a high enough bid to pay off all loans, including yours. We will say for the sake of argument, all the costs and fees are exactly the same in this scenario. And lender A needs 258,000. The only difference is you're not in a recorded lien position. The auction starts at lender A's minimum offer amount, 258,000. Crickets. 245,000. Crickets. Finally, 235,000 and someone bids. Congratulations, we have a winner. Well, not so fast. Lender A can decide not to accept a bid, even if that bidder won. What happens then, and more importantly, what happens to your investment? So now Lender A owns the property, meaning they now have title. When this happens, all liens are wiped out, and Lender A has a free and clear title. This is called REO or real estate owned. It's a great position for lender A, especially if that lender is in the business of making loans to fix and flip flippers or new construction. Why? Well, now they can either hold and rent the asset for cash flow until the market turns around, or they can complete the renovation if there is any still needed and either sell it at market value or again, rent it out and hold it until the market comes around. But what happens to your loan though? It's gone. It no longer exists, finito. It's a hard truth, but one that many private lenders, especially inexperienced lenders, fail to realize. And this is even more problematic when the borrower is the one, quote unquote, arranging all of your security as the lender. So what does Blue Bay Capital's turnkey solution look like? And really, where do you wanna find yourself on either side of this? If you're looking for secured positions, gap funding may not be the position you want to be in. First position is. If you're looking for a way to shift risk to the borrower, if you're funding gap funding, you are not doing that. You are assuming a lot of risk. If you're looking for a way to mitigate the value loss of a, of a potential value loss of an asset, be in first position. Do not fund gap funding. If you're looking for less risks, do not fund gap funding. You are taking on the most risk in any loan. So really the question that remains for you is Blue Bay Capital's turnkey private lending solution for you. If you're seeking truly passive investments for passive income, if you're looking for a lower risk yet higher return for safer investments, and if you're looking for investments where you are in control, my belief is that our turnkey private lending solution is perfect for you. My name is Edwin Epperson. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. This is how you can reach out to me. Uh, please connect on LinkedIn or Facebook. Happy to have a conversation and answer any questions you have concerning note investing versus origination. God bless. Make it a great rest of your week.